Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I've got what I would consider a very interesting and unique job to share with you. One that I've never seen anyone, I've never seen anybody make a set of these, I'll say that. I'm sure they have, but I've never seen it. And I think that you'll find what we are about to do pretty interesting. Now, I was asked by a local machinist who makes these parts, or similar parts to this, he does it part-time you know, on his, uh, on his, in his machine shop, but he did not have the tooling to make these parts himself. So he reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in trying to duplicate what we've got here. So let me show you what it, what that part actually is. And then we will get started trying to see if we can reproduce what we got here. So the parts that I've been asked to make are two very unique, Parker, what I believe is Parker, vice jaws. Now, these came off just an absolutely massive vice, if you can't tell. And I've got a photo that I'll lay in of the particular vice. I believe that the vice jaws here are going to go on. And I think it was missing one. So a gentleman reach out to uh, Logan Kendrick, who is a local machinist and the founder of AntiqueVices.com. He's also got a YouTube channel that can be found uh, at his website. He did not have the tooling to make this internal, to replicate this internal feature here. And I probably will have a little trouble doing it myself, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. Now, Logan makes all sorts of vice parts and jaws. He just couldn't reproduce these parts with what he had, so he reached out to me to see if I could. So I'll get you a shot, better shot, of this internal feature. We'll talk about why it's a problem. So check out the profile on the inside of this vice jaw. Kind of hard to reproduce. It is not a square slot. There's an angle here, angle here, and then we got a flat, basically a flat bottom that's parallel with the face of the jaw. Now, originally, I believe that this shape was produced with a custom ground horizontal milling cutter and then a fixture to hold the vice jaw at, an, at a slight angle. Now, if I had a bunch of these to do, I would go this route because it would be the fastest. And that is grind a custom cutter and then just do that slot in one or two passes. But because I've only got two vice jaws to make, I think I'm going to be doing this on the uh, vertical mill just to blast out the bulk of material. And then we'll go to the shaper and we will refine this shape with a compound of that machine. I think we can pull it off that way. So we're not gonna be reproducing the waffle face on this, even though we could. Uh, Logan's gonna do that uh, on, his, uh, on his CNC machine. So without the original tooling and fixturing to make these old parts, you sometimes you just gotta get creative and you know, do it the best way that you have with the, with the tooling that you have. So because I want to leave plenty of material for Logan to put this waffle on there, I'm not going to lay this on, on the plate and then just give him the minimum when I scribe this out of material. I'm going to set a parallel there and then butt this up. That'll give, because we've got the extra stock, I want to make sure that he's got plenty of material to get all of, uh, all of the features out of this jaw. Now this vice there, or the top of the vice jaw here, I mean, that's belt sander stuff. We may potentially profile that out on the shaper, I'm not for sure, and let him finish it on a sander, but we'll see. But I think that this is gonna work. Let's hold it up there and then scribe out our shape. So now that we got it laid out here, we can check these angles, see what they are. This is gonna be the face of the jaw. So we can use this little protractor to set up our compound on the shaper. So that, is a, that's 15 degrees. That little angle there, probably the same. And it is. And this is the bottom of this pocket parallel with the face. We'll see. So that, or 90 degrees, not 90, parallel. Yep, parallel, and then that line there is also parallel. So that should be easy enough. Parallel, parallel, 15 and 15.
So I've been going over potential ways to do this uh, for, for a few minutes now, and I think that probably my best bet is to just tandem these up, stick them in the shaper vise, because this machine has a long enough stroke and a big enough vise to clamp both of these at the same time, and just skip the milling machine. I'm not sure that it would save me that much time anyway, really, this machine. It peels metal pretty well, in case you didn't know. It's, it's very, very good at removing chunks of steel. But holding two individual blocks in this vise uh, presents a couple problems. If this was one long block, it wouldn't be a problem at all. But it is saw cut, and it's two individual chunks that are not exactly the same size. So let me show you what I'm going to try. And if it works, fine, and if it doesn't, we can regroup, go to the milling machine, use the original plan. But I think I'm going to try this first, simply because I may save some time by just doing it like this. Soft piece of copper wire, I just annealed it. And I'm going to stick that in the movable jaw here. Didn't burn me too bad. Stick that right there, right at the top of the jaw. And that should, con what it'll do is that wire will conform to the shape, put even pressure on them against the fixed jaw. That's kind of the thought anyway. First angle that I'm going to work is this short one here. Now I'm just going to cut all the way across, remove all that bulk of material, and that is 70 degrees. So I'm just going to tilt this head to 70 degrees and I'll feed with the compound. And we're just going to be working off the graduations. There's no reason, these are vice jaws, no reason to break out the sign bar or something like this. So here's the cutter that we're using. It's a half inch by five eighths piece of Momax Super Cobalt. Somebody's ground, ground it to those dimensions. But all I'm doing is honing that edge. I put a decent little radius on the edge there and all I'm doing is removing the grinding marks that I produced on the bench grinder. It'll just make that edge stronger, make it last a little bit longer maybe and potentially give me a better surface finish. So a good way to test your edge, I ain't trying to make this thing pretty, I'm just trying to make it work. But a good way to test it to see if it's sharp is just see if it peels up your fingernail. If it does that you got a decently uh, sharp edge there, and it should should cut fine.
Well, I'm making good progress. It is. It's time for a cutter adjustment, though. I really don't like the chips that I'm getting off of this. They're getting really hot. They're wanting to bunch up on the edge. I'm going to try to increase the rake angle on this leading edge of this cutter and see, see if that keeps the chips from welding to the edge. I'm just going to give it a little more a little more rake and maybe that'll help the chip curl more and uh, keep it from welding to the welding to the face of the cutter although the cutter's holding up really good just don't like the chip that it's forming so there's a look at the cutter and all i'm going to do is increase that rake just a little bit and see if that'll help me get a, a more curled chip and stop it from kind of bunching up on the on the edge there. Will it work? I don't know, but that's what I'm going to try. I think it will. Focus. I'm going to try that. So we're over here at the big do-all mill and machine. I have decided to go with my original plan and that is to split the operations between these two and I'm going to rough out the innards, the rough internals of these vice jaws one at a time uh, in, the, in the vise here. I just think it will probably speed things up a little bit and then I can refine the shape in the shaper.
that's the plan. So let's uh, get set up. I'm going to use a three quarter inch high speed steel reground roughing end mill to blast out with coolant to blast out the majority of the internals here. And then we'll go back over to the shaper and refine it and hopefully you know, get some nice vice jaws out of this. So this is a rougher that I reground some time ago. We'll see how it does. Should do fine. That it's high speed steel, but it'll hold up just fine if we put the coolant to it. Where is that? All right, so you get the idea. There's one. I'm gonna jam this other one in there, rough it out just the same way, and we'll meet up over the shaper. We'll get set up, and we'll do that uh, internal angle. So now that I've got the majority of the excess material removed from these soon-to-be vice jaws, it's time for me to focus on this internal pocket here. So what I'm going to do is shape this. This is a parting blade blank. It's just been narrowed. It is parallel on all sides. There is no, no relief in this thing whatsoever. So all that's been done is narrowed. So I'm going to cut, grind a 15 degree angle on this thing. That way I can come in 
cut this back angle, a little 15 degree, and feed down and cut this front 15 degree angle and still keep a nice parallel bottom with the face of the jaw. Now I'm also going to, because I was asked to, is to remove the bulk of the material that is outside of the scribed line there uh, to the, it's where it fits to the top of the vise. Now that, in my opinion, what I would do if it was mine is finish it with an angle grinder and a flap disc. It is a bench vise. Um, I just want to help by, because I was asked to, by removing the bulk of the material out there and we're just going to play around with the compound and, and whittle it away. Uh, same, same down here. And then he's going to hold it on the ends and he's going to do the waffling, or Lo Logan, he, Logan, uh, he's going to put the waffle face on it. So, let's go over to the bench grinder. We'll lay this out real quick with some, with some blue, and then we'll go over to the bench grinder. We'll relieve this just slightly so it doesn't, so it cuts and doesn't rub. We'll get set up and start, start cleaning up this internal pocket. So check out this old Baldor bench grinder. It's actually do-all badged, but it is a Baldor bench grinder. Nice heavy cast iron uh, wheel guards with the dust extraction ports on the back. I love this grinder. It's got a lot of weight to it, runs really smooth, doesn't vibrate, and uh, it's got plenty of power. It's a half horsepower uh, unit. I've ground quite a few tools on this thing since I got it, and I really en just enjoy using it. Uh, Learning to use one of these and grinding your own tools is a very useful thing. They don't have to be perfect, right? You get better as you go, and it saves you a ton of money if you're the type of person like I was who bought the brazed-on carbide when it first got started. And, uh, you know, you're using a hobby lathe in most cases, like I was, and the brazed-on carbide, you know, carbide, hobby lathes don't always go together uh, that well, and you end up buying a lot of tooling. And eventually that gets very old and then uh, you know a handful of high-speed steel a bench grinder and you're off to the races a little bit of time behind one trying different grinds reading in the books and trying to replicate what you see in there for different you know, different profile tools it was well worth the time that I spent reading and screwing up high-speed steel um, you know and I still do it on occasion but it's nice to be able to grind your own stuff. All right, so here's the setup. Compounds at 15, tools ground to 15, and the face of the tool is set flat against the bottom. We've got the clapper set to where the tool swings up 
on the reverse, we don't want the tool to drag back. If we rotated this the other way, it would tilt into the work, hang and hang. So compound 15, clapper angled away from the direction of cut. That way it swings out and back and tool set square with the bottom, ground at 15 degrees. I think this is gonna work. Light cut first, see how it acts. I think it's gonna work. Alright, let's feed in a bit. So here's a shortcut in real time, just kind of a peaceful machine to run the Shaper, even though it's not a, necessarily a fast machine, I think you spend about 30% 30, 30 of your time with the RAM running in reverse, it actually runs in reverse faster than it runs forward uh, due to just the way that it's designed, but that gives time for the, the tool to cool down, that's why coolant's not really necessary in most cases on the Shaper. I do use oil simply because it keeps the chips from welding to the base of the tool or it helps you know, to keep that from happening. But seldom do you overheat a tool unless you're running you know, really fast uh, stroke per minute. So great machine to have in any shop for these one-off jobs where you know, maybe 
you don't have a multi-axis CNC machine to cut an angle like this or want to spend you know half a day building a fixture I'll throw it in the shaper twist the compound and this is what they're good at cutting angles and I like my machine it's why I got it why I continue to keep it just because of its versatility no obviously not because of its speed but it is a great machine very accurate and a pleasure to run one of my favorite machines in the shop really. so I've had this shaper probably for about eight years now one of the main things that was appealing to me in the beginning was the low cost of ownership of a shaper because they sell cheap you know, a lot of people don't see that they have any any purpose in the modern modern world with CNC but the cost of ownership for one of these is next to nothing a guy can have one in his home shop he can have, get a handful of high-speed steel tooling and that's it not like a horizontal mill where you gotta buy arbors and horizontal milling cutters and you know, all of the extra kit that it takes to run one of those you know, shapers just unique in the way that it, shapers and planers high-speed steel really all you need that and a bench grinder and you are uh, good to go so, not necessarily a production machine in today's world, but for the one-off shop or the prototyping shop, you know, there's, there's still a place for them. Just not in high-speed production. Pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good. So that is quite a big pile of chips and that's not counting the chips that I made actually on the on the milling machine. So almost done, but I'm out of time for this week. Let me show you what I what I got so far and uh, and then we'll sign it off. So that's how far I got. Not quite finished, just I'm out of time. Just started profiling this one. I'm gonna get it just a little bit closer to what the original is, and then I'm gonna let Logan finish them on out and put the face on them. But my job, pretty much complete, and that is pocketing these things, and they turned out really, really nice. I mean, they're vice jaws. Turned out good. So not quite finished, but I'm close. So do me a favor, go check out Logan Kendrick at antiquevices.com. He builds a lot of parts and pieces for vices and stuff that are, where you just can't get them anymore. That's what this is all about. Can't buy these things, so your only option is to either make them yourself or find somebody who can, and that's where uh, Logan comes in. So antiquevices.com, and you can find his YouTube channel uh, on his website. So go check him out and subscribe to his channel. Help him out. He's just getting just getting started be nice to see his channel grow you know it's all about helping everybody out so that is it for this week thanks for watching viewers patrons subscribers anyone who's helped me out whatsoever it is much appreciated so that's it thanks for watching and i'll see you next time you ready to go to the house hmm are you ready let's go to the house